Well, good morning. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas, and I want to talk to you about happy endings. We love them, right? We love happy endings, don't we? But if you're like me, you hate the things in the movie that takes forever to finally lead up to the happy ending. Declan and I uh, really enjoy the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and we've probably watched it all the way through at least once a year. In fact, Declan has read The Hobbit, and he's currently reading the first book of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Well, we watched the extended versions of the film, and that came out after the movies came out on Blu-ray, and if you watch all three extended versions, that is 11 hours of movie watching. Yep, 11 hours for three movies. And the last film, The Return of the King, has been criticized for having an extensive ending. The epilogue is almost an hour long. It takes one hour for the main characters to all take their curtain bow. But come on, I mean, you just watched 10 hours of story. You know, I paid my $10.50 for this ticket and by golly, I want my happy ending. And, and sure, there's some kind of, you know, schmaltzy moments. There's some tearjerkers as saying goodbye to Frodo as he gets on the boat to leave Middle Earth and then going home with Sam and seeing him hug his kids and kiss his wife. It's magical, it's typical, but guess what? I don't care, I got my happy ending. We don't care how corny the story becomes because I think deep down, we all want that. We all want that, to ride off into the sunset. We want the adoption letter to come at the last minute. We wanna see the lovers embrace and kiss. We want our happy ending. Friends, this is what you have in Jesus already, right? Because no matter what we go through in life, if you have Jesus, then you have your happy ending. There is a lot of sadness and there is a lot of fear right now in the world. You can adopt an attitude of doom and gloom right now in 2021 just by watching the news. California is on fire. People we know have COVID. Uh, people we know are dying from COVID. And it's getting worse again, not better. We didn't turn a corner. It feels like we slipped back down the hill. Tropical Depression Fred made its landfall in Florida. The Taliban have taken over Afghanistan. Watch the news for longer than five minutes. And yes, you get this feeling of being fearful, but not the believer, because tomorrow is just another day, and that day leads us to the greatest day. And we know how the movie ends. Romans 8, 18 says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Philippians 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Corey Ten Boom grew up in a religious family. And during World War II, she and her family harbored hundreds of Jews to protect them from the arrest from the Nazis. She was betrayed by a fellow Dutch citizen. Her entire family was imprisoned. And Corey survived, and she started a worldwide ministry. And later, she ended up telling her entire story in a book called The Hiding Place. My grandmother, used to read us this book when we were very young. A quote from Corey Ten Boom, and uh, this is something that Joanna and I have held very dear to us our entire marriage. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Last week, we said that our jumping off point, our first step on this road, this path, is that we needed to begin from the most simplest spot from the very beginning, and that beginning is God loves us, right? God loves you. How does that message make you feel? 
when you hear that, God loves you. Does it give you joy? Because Christians are supposed to be joy-filled. We're not supposed to be doom and gloom. We're not supposed to be nervous or scared or in fear. We're not supposed to be looking for conspiracies. We're not supposed to be afraid of the government or afraid of the news or afraid of big pharma. Christians are supposed to be full of joy. God has his love and that love goes in and then the joy comes out. Church, church, this is where we worship. This is where we worship an all-powerful, all-amazing God who made us, he made us unique, he hand-knit us, he loves us, so we should be joy-filled. It should show on our faces when we worship, we should smile, we, we, when we worship, we should clap, we should shout, we should raise our hands. Well, I wasn't raised that way. Okay, I wasn't either. 1 Samuel 13 says David was a man after God's own heart. He made a lot of mistakes, cheated on his wife, killed a lot of people in war, but nobody could argue that that guy didn't know how to worship. In 2 Samuel, David is crowned king, and immediately he begins a military campaign to defeat God's enemies, the Philistines. And after defeating the Philistines, David and his company, they parade back into town. 2 Samuel 6 says, And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the horn. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she was despised in him in all her heart. David is wearing a linen ephod, which is the breastplate of the high priest. But the Bible doesn't say what else he's wearing or not wearing. What we do know is that his wife was mad at him, and she said that her actions were embarrassing. She says in verse 20, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of the servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. See, this is why Baptists are afraid to dance. <laughs> People dance in the Bible, and then they get yelled at. David's wife sees her husband, the king, not dressed like a king, and certainly not acting like a king. And this is how David responds to the criticism. It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord, and I will make myself yet more contemptible than this. David says, I'm worshiping God. And you think that, you think that was bad? You think that was embarrassing? I'm willing to become even more undignified for God. I will gladly embarrass myself even further. I am not ashamed to raise my hands or to dance. In fact, you know the word uh, hallelujah, right? Hallelujah. Uh, Christians use that. We shout that out in church. And for those of you who've listened to my sermons for any amount of time, you know I love etymology. You know I love uh, language, finding out where words come from. Hallelujah is a compound word. The beginning is the word hallel. Hallel uh, just means to praise, okay? And Yah is the first syllable of God's name, Yahweh. So hallelujah literally means praise God. But wait, there's more. <laughs> hallel can also mean to move in a circle or to dance or to celebrate. So whenever you say hallelujah, what you're really saying is my heart and my life dances and praises God. Why is David leaping and dancing? David leaped and danced because of God, because of the joy that was in his heart. Worship is my response to all that God does for me. And so therefore, I choose joy. Joy is my choice. Joy and celebration are a choice. That means joy is not dependent on my circumstances. How come you don't smile when you sing? Move your arms, move your hips, shout hallelujah. Eh, I don't feel like it. I wanna read to you something. This is Paul listing out all of his hardships. 
He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Paul was beaten. He was imprisoned just for talking about Jesus. He was hated by his own people. He was uh, considered a, a traitor by the Pharisees. He was arrested, beaten, thrown in jail. Did that kill his joy? Did Paul's circumstances kill his joy? What does Paul say? From prison to the church in Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Seems impossible, doesn't it? You know, you, you, you know those people, right? You know those people, they're always happy. They never say a bad thing about anyone ever. Always, they, they just have this positive outlook. They never complain. Must be tough, right? No, it's a choice. Paul tells you, rejoice. He tells you to rejoice, always. So you, you, you have a choice. You can wallow, you can complain, you can look at the world around you, you can cry, you can hide, you can point fingers of blame. But according to the Bible, the Christian should be joy-filled. And that's one of the keys to living your best life. Social media, for example, they put a lot of pressure on you. There's a lot of specific expectations of what it means to live your best life. And we're under that pressure. And, and so we think that we have to expect, or that we have to conform to what society expects. For example, we're pressured to look a certain way, or to be a certain weight, or to wear certain clothes, or to have exciting adventures, or to drink a certain cup of coffee, or to have eye-catching friends, or to be married, or to be single, or to be ethical, or to eat healthy food, or to do chari charity work. It, it, the list goes on and on and on and on. But in the end, we are spending too much time worrying about what other people are doing or what other people expect of us, what society expects of us, and then we begin to lose track of what makes us happy, of what brings us joy, and what living our best life really looks like. You have a choice. You can take action. You can live your best life. Or you can do nothing. You can cry about it. You can stay at home. You can protest. It's up to you. So take Paul's advice. Choose joy. Paul says, choose joy always. How? Just walk around with a smile on my face? No. No, no, no. And since Pastor Paul is the one telling us to be joyful, let's just continue to seek his advice, okay? He says in that same book, in Philippians, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what is, lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, forget your past, forget it. Forget your past. It's done. It's over. You can't go back and fix it. Stop dwelling on it. Stop thinking about it. Just move on. Let it go. All those mistakes, all those failures, all those hangups, forget it. Because if you don't, you're going to spend the rest of your life rehashing arguments and, and conversations. You're going to be digging up all the ghosts of your past. You know, I said earlier, we all want a happy ending, right? Well, sometimes when we revisit the past like that and we dwell on our mistakes, what we're doing is we're cycling through those things to see if maybe we screwed up. Did I screw up? Did I ruin the chance of me having a happy ending? You didn't. See, the good news is you, you don't need that do-over. You don't need to go back and fix those mistakes. You are still on the path to a happy ending. You know how I know? Because God is in charge 
of your happy ending. And he says that he has forgotten your past. Psalm 103 verse 10 says, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. What does that mean? It means he doesn't hold our past against us. Verse 11 says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the steadfast love toward those who fear him. Remember, God loves you. God loves you, but, 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 where is our sin? Where is our sin? Where did our sin go? Verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. It's gone. Our sin, our past is gone. Hebrews 8 says, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. God loves you. Remember, this is our jumping off point. God loves you, so your sin, your past, it's erased. Listen, the only person who's still dwelling about your past is you. So let it go. The only one judging you for your past is you. Let it go. How can you let it go? Well, you just stay focused. Stay focused. Listen to what Paul says again. This is 2 Corinthians 10. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Paul says you take those thoughts and you take them captive. You train your mind. You take control of those negative thoughts that, that creep up. You take them captive and you just give them back to God. When you wanna, when you wanna raise your hands and you wanna smile in church and then there's something inside of you that says, ah, you're not really that kind of person. You're, 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 uh, you're not good enough to do that. You take that thought captive and you choose joy. You forget the past and you accept God's forgiveness. You have to accept it. You have to let it wash over you. Second Corinthians says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. Listen, every single person who's watching this right now has lied, has cheated, they've made a host of bad decisions, and we've all had evil thoughts. We've even all been like Peter and denied Christ simply by the way we've lived. But that's not the end of the story. The credits haven't started yet. There's still a more important part of this story to tell, and that's the cross. That's the empty tomb. That's the resurrection. That's your new life in Jesus. And that's the promise of heaven. God died in your place. He pardoned your punishment. He took your place. And the nails that went through his hands were the nails that were supposed to be going through yours. He took that all on. That's forgiveness. He took it. He took your host of screw-ups and all your bad attitudes and all your mistakes, he took that. The Hebrew hymnal says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler and you will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day. David, David sings, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, though my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. This is the reason we sing. This is the reason we dance and raise our hands in church because you are forgiven. And that is the reason you can choose joy. Always. You are forgiven. You are living your best life because you're forgiven. Third, keep your eyes on heaven. Forget your past. Accept God's forgiveness and keep your eyes on heaven. John 
John got a glimpse of heaven, and this is what he says. Then the angel of the Lord showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the, of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp for the sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. That's your future. That's your happy ending. It's already written. It's happened. You won the lottery. You came in first. You get the girl. The prince comes to your rescue, and you ride off together on the white horse. Why choose joy? Because you know how this story ends. You know, you know already the most important thing. Go back to Paul again. 2 Corinthians 4, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You are a Christian. This life that we're living right now, it's only the first three pages of the book. We, we have a long way to go. Keep your eye on heaven. Stop looking down. When you worship, when you sing, don't look at your shoes. Heck, don't even look at your worship team. Don't look at the choir. Look up. Look up. S Sunday is not the end of a seven-day screw-up. Sunday is the beginning of an entire week of God's blessing. It is the beginning of an entire week of God's love. It is the beginning of an entire week of God's forgiveness. Live your best life and choose joy always. Choose joy always. Romans 8 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. How did Paul choose joy amidst all of his hardships? Because he let the past go. He accepted God's forgiveness and he kept his life in proper perspective because he kept his eyes on heaven. Sunday, this day, this is the first day of potential. This is the first day of a week with God. A week with God's love. A week protected under God's shield. A week with God as my refuge. A week with God as my fortress. A week where God is my light and he is my sun forever and ever. You don't face these next seven days alone. The same God who parted the Red Sea and brought down the walls of Jericho, resurrected Lazarus, is going with you in your life right now. And God loves you. And he's offering you your best life. A life of love, a life of joy, actually overflowing, all-encompassing joy. Choose joy always. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your gift of joy. The gifts that you give us the rain that comes down, the blessing, forgiveness, grace, acceptance, adoption, love. Lord, I have no reason to not live in joy. You have erased my past, you have forgiven my sins, and you lead me ever onward with your light. Lord, may the only thing from my mouth be joy. May I preach your kingdom come and your will be done these next seven days. May I leap and dance and sing in your kingdom because I am your son. I am your daughter and you are my heavenly 
Father. Not just for today or tomorrow or the next week or the next year, forever. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. I love you guys. Thanks for hanging out with us this day. Don't forget, you can always come back here. We've got a weekly devotional that begins uh, our week. It kind of lets you know what to expect coming up in the sermon series. And uh, these sermons, the, the pre- preaching sermons, will always happen a little later in the day now. We're trying to encourage you to come back to church, return to church. We want to see your faces. We want to see those hands. We want to see those smiles. We have two services, 9.30, uh, our traditional service with our choir, and 11 o'clock, a little bit more contemporary uh, with our worship team and we also have youth group that meets at that time. We also have a youth group that meets during the week every Wednesday at six o'clock. It's open to any youth that want to come, any youth at all. We love you guys. Stay safe. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.